for another one of our educational webinars where again we're featuring a guest today on the webinar sharing some expertise uh, uh, that's tangentially it's related to uh, IRAs and self-directed IRAs and what a lot of people uh, look to invest in uh, using their accounts. Um, today's title of the webinar is Tips to Avoiding Foreclosure when you're investing in private mortgages. And certainly, again, you can invest in private mortgages personally. You can use your IRA to do so as well. And we've had a lot of people go through that process. And we're fortunate enough today to be joined uh, by an attorney, Tony Woodward, who's going to join us here in a few minutes and really give us more information uh, about that. Um, so I really appreciate everybody who's logged in and called in today uh, live. If you're listening live, you'll have the ability during the presentation, if you have any questions uh, for either Tony or myself, you can type the question into the chat box on your screen, and we'll make sure we get to those as they come up. So please utilize that feature as we go through the presentation. Uh, if you're watching the recording of this, either uh, later or within a few days, or maybe it's a few months from now or whatnot, you have questions for either Tony or myself, our contact information will be at the end of the presentation, so you can reach out to either one of us uh, for additional assistance. My name is Scott Maurer. I'm the Director of Business Development for Advanta IRA. I've been a member of the Florida Bar since 2005. I'm also an attorney, but what's really different, why I'm excited to have Tony on today, is that I cannot give legal advice and can't represent certainly any Advanta clients. And certainly that's something Tony can do because he's not an Advanta employee. Um, so that's my, my educational background. I've been with the company now over 10 years, uh, doing a lot of transactions, helping people go through the process of investing their IRA into private loans. Um, I spent more of the last few years really educating people about what's possible with a self-directed IRA and how you can invest it. One quick disclaimer, uh, again, Advanced does not endorse any particular products or in particular investments, and we talk a lot about the types of investments you can make. For instance, you can make an investment into a private loan using your IRA account as the bank, which we'll talk about here in just a moment. But again, we're not going to provide the advice and say you should do that or you shouldn't do that, or if you're lending money to a particular individual or securing that loan with a particular type of asset. That's more for your decision. We're not going to give you advice in that arena. Uh, we also don't give legal or tax advice. Now, we will talk about legal issues today, talk about tax issues. Uh, we can sometimes make you aware of uh, some things that are out there. It's up to you ultimately to determine you know, what steps to take. Uh, and certainly, as we've had Tony on here, if you had a legal question, um, we can certainly refer you to people like Tony to help you out, or refer you to Tony, for instance, and actually have him help you out and give you that type of advice. Uh, our, just a quick background on our company. We've been around since 2004, and the only thing we do at Advanta is administer self-directed IRA accounts. We do not hold any non-qualified funds, money that is other than retirement funds. Um, so the only thing we do is hold those assets and do the administration, basically receiving payments in, paying bills out for the various types of assets that our clients hold. Again, we're not investment advisors, or so we're not trying to put our clients into a particular mutual fund or a stock holding or any other type of investments, not what we do. What we do is just offer a superior customer service experience uh, for all of our clients. We are very attentive uh, to what our clients need. We have an account manager system that gives them better service than they would get maybe from other custodians around the country. Very quickly, why haven't people heard of self-directed IRAs? Very simple reason. I think most IRA accounts that individuals have or retirement accounts, they're with a brokerage firm, they're with a bank, who offers that client a limited investment product. They allow them to invest in mutual funds or stocks, things that they sell, not really go outside of their area of expertise and allow people to self-direct. And it takes a special individual or an individual who's concerned about their retirement to actually take the, that next step and look and see what else is out there. So the IRA custodians that most people have their funds with are not going to advertise to their customers that they can invest in a much broader range of investments. A lot of people have to find that out on their own, coming to a seminar or perhaps just seeing an advertisement uh, for self-direction. IRS regulations do allow for a very, very broad range of investments, private loans being one of them that we're going to talk about today. Now, as far as the types of accounts that can be self-directed, um, any type of IRA, traditional or Roth uh, account, can be self-directed. Um, a traditional Roth are individual accounts. Uh, they're tax, they have different tax treatment when you are either contributing to them at, at the beginning of the year or when you're taking money out uh, in retirement. That's where the difference is between the traditional and Roth. Uh, Employer-based accounts, the SEP and simple IRAs, are ideal for small business owners, sole proprietors, it enables you to put more money away in a given year than do the traditional or Roth account. 
Uh, we also offer a solo 401k account. And any former employer's plan, an old 401k, an old 403b that's still sitting there with your old employer doing nothing or, or perhaps not doing what you think it should be doing, you can certainly take those monies and roll them over and turn self-directed. So just illustrating, again, any type of IRA can be self-directed. Any type of former employer plan can also be included and invested into some of the assets that we talk about during our seminars. Now, again, we do a lot of other investments other than private lending, but since that's the focus of today's webinar with our guests, let's focus that pretty much here where we're talking about this next slide. There's lots of different types of private lending. Now, again, there's lots of types of assets you can invest in with a self-directed IRA. The only things you can't do, you can't buy life insurance and you can't buy collectibles. So that leaves a large variety and, and, and a large number of different assets you can invest in. And in kind of one of those areas is private lending. And even with pr in private lending, there's a lot of different and unique things you can do with your IRA acting as a lender and acting in the, in the place of a bank. Your IRA could be just a traditional mortgage lender. Your IRA basically standing in the place of a Wells Fargo, um, of a Bank of America, where you're issuing a loan out of your IRA, getting a piece of real estate as collateral, and then getting paid over the next 10 to 15 years uh, back in the mortgage. There are people who do short-term transactional funding, where you're kind of you're funding just uh, someone for a very short period of time, probably still collateralizing it, but the, the time frame is not nearly as long as a traditional mortgage. Uh, we see also unsecured promissory notes, a much riskier type of investment. The IRS, though, does not require you to actually have collateral for, for a loan. And as you can see, we also see individuals do equity participation, and you can secure your IRA loan actually with assets other than real estate, using farm, animals, livestock, uh, automobiles, etc. Now, why do people invest in private loans? I think some of the, the biggest reasons that we've been talking with people over the years that we, we see from them it's attractive to an individual to be able to act as that bank. You, the money is yours and being able to lend it out, setting the terms at which someone will borrow the funds from you, setting the terms at which that IRA is going to grow is very enticing. And using a private loan, when you're setting an interest rate and you're getting a, on a well-collateralized loan, you kind of almost know then what your IRA is growing uh, each year. For some individuals, it's, uh, they like the fact that investing in a private loan, uh, there's less liability than investing in owning a real estate directly. If you had your IRA go out and actually buy a piece of real estate, um, you might be subject to um, more liability based on the fact that you're the owner of the real estate. If someone slips and falls on the property, they're going to sue the owner of the property. They're not going to sue the bank or the lender who's holding the mortgage. Private lending can also, can also be a low-maintenance asset, although as we'll talk about with Tony here in a few minutes, I'm sure there's some thing, un unfortunate circumstances when there is more maintenance required. There are more actions required uh, when individuals aren't paying. But if you have, again, a well-collateralized loan and a, and a person who is paying on a consistent basis, it can be a very low-maintenance asset. You just simply have to wait for a check to come in and be deposited each month. Now, when you go, do go to create your private loans, you establish the note terms, how much an individual can borrow from you, what interest rate you're going to charge them, what the... Uh, you know, when the maturity date of that loan is, when does that person actually have to pay your IRA back on the, on the maturity date? Is there any equity participation terms? Is it amortized? Is it interest only? Again, all those terms and, and that go into to making a loan. If you were to go to a bank today and ask somebody, a loan officer at Wells Fargo, to lend you money on a piece of real estate, they're going to set all those terms for you by looking at your credit, looking at the collateral. Same thing happens if someone's borrowing money from your IRA, only you're now sitting in that banker's spot telling that individual, here are the terms in which I will lend you money from my IRA account. Now, just to briefly take you through the process of how it works, we have an individual, Paul, has money in an old 401k and is interested in, in better returns and doing that through private lending. So Paul's first step would be to set up an IRA account with us at Advanta, instruct his old administrator of the 401k to roll over the funds into his IRA account, doing a rollover process, the tax-free movement of money. Once the funds are in Paul's IRA at Advanta, he would then instruct us, I would like you to make this loan out of my IRA as a first mortgage. Uh, we would then work with that. Our, our role at Advanta is then to work with the attorney, with the closing agent, to make sure that this loan is properly titled in the name of his IRA account. That's a very important part of the process is that the IRA, Paul's IRA, must be listed as the lender in the documents. And as Tony, I'm sure, will talk about it, that's going to be the name 
of the party if there's any ever any foreclosure actions or other alternatives that he may pursue. So Paul works with the borrower to lend the money. The terms, $120,000 loan, 8% interest. It's a 30-year mortgage with a five-year balloon. So his monthly payment, he's getting about $880 right back in his IRA. And he has a first mortgage on the property. Again, something very important in the process, if something were to go wrong, in this case, Paul has the first mortgage on the property. He's not in a second or third or fourth position, subject to the other creditors are in front of him. So he does secure the asset with a first mortgage. And then going forward, once the investment is completed, once we've sent the money to the title agent and completed the mortgage process, his borrower is then going to send the monthly interest payments to Advanta. So his borrower writes a check out to Advanta IRA for benefit of Paul's account, mails that check to us at Advanta, we will receive it, deposit it into his account. Paul can then track his, his payments using our online statements and also the fact that he can check, uh, our system will automatically email him when each payment arrives. So as the payment comes in, we deposit it today, Paul will get an email at the end of the day letting him know that $880 was deposited into his IRA account. So again, for a lot of our clients, that's how the process works. We just continue to receive mortgage payments or loan payments in on a regular basis. What if Paul's borrower stops paying on the note? What would be his options at that time? And that's why we brought in Tony Woodward today to talk about, he's an attorney in Tampa. He's, I know he's worked with a few of our clients in the past. Tony, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. Thank you, Scott. Good. Well, I'm going, to, I'm going to turn the presentation over here to Tony, uh, let him talk to you about tricks to avoiding foreclosure on a privately owned mortgage. And I do, before I turn it over, I want to remind everyone who's listening, as you have questions for Tony, or if you have questions maybe about something I covered, please type them into the chat box on the screen. I'll uh, make sure you get those questions answered throughout the course of this, the webinar today. So you can use, utilize that chat feature. Um, Tony, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Scott. I um want to welcome everyone and uh, good afternoon. I, um, I'm often, uh, a large part of my practice has to do with mortgage law and I'm often asked uh, the questions about whether or not foreclosures do uh, present the horror stories that everybody is reading about. And the answer to that is absolutely uh, in Florida, which is where my operation is, I uh, and all uh, other foreclosure lawyers that I know about have experienced an incredibly um, increased delay and, and cost associated with, with getting the property foreclosed on and liquidated uh, in Florida because of uh, two primary factors. One is the large number of foreclosures that the court system has had to absorb over the last five to eight uh, years. And the second is the, the budget constraints of the foreclosure clerks. So what they have done is passed a lot of that cost on in enhanced filing fees, uh, as well as uh, setting up special dockets that make it very difficult to advance a foreclosure on the court docket. Uh, Fifteen years ago, I used to get a foreclosure done in, in four, four and a half months. The average foreclosure now takes two years and costs in excess of $5,000. So I guess the first thing is, you know, why, why should you listen to me? I, I've been in practicing creditor's rights law for uh, over 26 years, I am the founder uh, and, and shareholder of my uh, law firm, Woodward Law Group. I also have mortgages in my personal portfolio that I have managed for years. I've also originated, underwritten, tracked, and assisted other clients in, uh, the, in their mortgage portfolio. I have one client that uh, had at one point an $11 million dollar mortgage portfolio that I managed. In fact, I located, tracked, and closed, because I'm also a closing agent, uh, that entire portfolio for him. The other thing is what I was alluding to earlier, and that is what I call the 2-5 rule. Always remember that when you are making the decision of whether I should foreclose or not, remember the 2-5 rule, and that is two years and 
In other words, it's on average taking that long and costing at least that amount to uh, get a foreclosure processed. Uh, what should you do if a borrower gets behind on mortgage payments, taxes, or insurance? Well, if you currently own mortgages in your portfolio, whether they be uh, self-directed or otherwise, the worst thing to do is to uh, do nothing. You must act quickly. You must be very active and not passive. Uh, demand letters are, are required to, to set the tone for the borrower, especially if the default is uh, early on. The, the worst thing to do is to become friendly and involved with the borrower because much like in the landlord-tenant arena, they will take advantage of that. And the, 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 the reason it's, that's important is because the farther they get behind, the harder it becomes for them to get current. They will quickly become uh, comfortable uh, to the concept of not having a mortgage payment, and that money will be spent elsewhere. So I always counsel my clients to immediately send a demand letter from a lawyer you know, a $50 demand letter can go a long ways early on to letting the customer know that you will not tolerate a slow pay uh, or non-payment and assessing and making sure that you assess late penalties and let them know that, uh, that, that you're, you're serious about your collection. A lot of people sort of take advantage of the fact that, oh, well, you know, he's a private, he's not a big bank, and he's not going to do anything about it. And I've had clients that will wait, the privates, wait eight months or more before they ever refer the matter over to me to commence the foreclosure process. Huge mistake. Um, the, the, the next thing you want to do, if it looks like things are not uh, going according to the amortization, is you need to get a broker's price opinion or, or an appraisal. Now, a broker's price opinion is from a realtor, a, a, a licensed broker, and that broker basically does comparables and, and, and generates value opinion, but not a formal, they're not licensed appraisers. Uh, an appraisal, obviously, everyone is probably familiar with, albeit that may cost uh, three, $400, you have to get a good handle on your equity cushion, especially if your loan is seasoned, the value you thought it was may not be the value that it is today. Uh, and so you have to get a good uh, handle on your equity value to know what leverage you do and don't have in the negotiations prior to foreclosure. There are other uh, sites, uh, Property Appraiser, uh, Zillow, Realtor.com, Trulia.com, all of which are excellent sources of, of information and factors that go to value. Uh, what happens if the borrower is delinquent on the real property taxes or insurance? Um, if you're not escrowing taxes and insurance, then you need to demand that these defaults be cured. Obviously, it's better uh, if you can escrow taxes and uh, insurance because that's uh, two of the largest mistakes that I see being made uh, in, in, in not handling uh, insurance uh, or not getting an update on insurance and payment of taxes. Again, the, the farther that the borrower goes into the hole, the harder it is for you to get them out of the hole, not to mention the fact that, in, that, that, that property taxes, uh, at least in Florida, are, a, are ahead of your mortgage position. So that's a direct erosion of your equity position uh, in, in the investment. For insurance, uh, the, the, the obvious reason there is if you've underwritten a $100,000 home to have a $80,000 house on it and it burns down and for some reason insurance lapsed, you just suffered a, a, a substantial loss. Easy enough to prevent by simply making sure that you have a loss payee uh, or additional insured certificate that allows 
uh, you to be comfortable that if there was uh, an event of casualty that you're listed in the in the mortgage I mean, excuse me the insurance company's records as uh, being first in line for uh, payment. That's uh, 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 another area that people will often neglect. Um, and, and another, when someone presents to you something called evidence of insurance, if it does not list you, you um, or your IRA uh, account expressly on it as an additional insured, uh, you are not an additional insured, and that certificate that you're holding is a worthless piece of paper. All that means is that at the time that that was issued, there was insurance on the property, and you're now a certificate holder of the evidence of insurance. So, again, critical that that is done properly. Um, Tony, if I can, if don't mind just stepping in here a second. I did have a couple of questions and comments come up. Um, someone asked you just to read. Uh, one thing wants to know if you, somebody wants to know if you work in states other than Florida. I, I, I do not. Uh, my practice is limited to Florida, but I have a network of others in other states that I refer my multi-state clients to. And, I, and I'm sure a lot of the information you're presenting here, this, a lot of this is, is, is great information, will be good. I mean, the, the advice and the counsel is, is good regardless of state lines. There might be laws you have to think about, but I mean, what you're talking about is good advice regardless, correct? Yes, exactly. Uh, it, it, there are two different types of of states, there are judicial foreclosure states, and there are, are non-judicial or trust states, where the trust states are, are, are entirely different than the judicial foreclosure. The, what I'm talking about today is, uh, is the judicial foreclosure states. Okay. Uh, one person's had another comment, and we'll, we'll let you get back to the presentation. Said, if you don't mind uh, repeating the comment regarding real estate taxes taking precedent. Yeah, so um, if the borrower does not pay the real property taxes, then what happens is at the end of one year, the uh, local tax collector issues what's called a tax certificate, which is another investment vehicle for another seminar uh, or webinar. Uh, those tax certificates take precedence over your mortgage. Uh, so that uh, unpaid tax obligation must be paid from uh, the proceeds of the property uh, one of two ways. The, if you're my client, I will not allow uh, more than two tax certificates to get issued if we're in a bogged down, uh, protracted uh, foreclosure. You will have to advance that tax certificate uh, the oldest tax certificate in order to avoid what's called a tax deed sale, which is you losing your mortgage interest. This rarely happens because you will get notice from the tax collector. So the, the key issue there is just simply monitor the taxes, and if they get severely delinquent, then and the borrower is is not making payments and is sort of gone rogue on you, then you must advance that certificate. And as long as you have equity uh, in uh, the property, then th then it's not a concern because that advance, if your mortgage uh, uh, and note provides for this, and most do, the ad advances such as paying the borrower's insurance, paying taxes. Uh, th those types of advances are added to your indebtedness, and your indebtedness uh, will, again, be in a first mortgage position. It's just that the tax collector has priority, and that if you let the tax collector go severely delinquent, they'll apply for a tax deed, and if you allow the third certificate to get issued, even when you get notice of the tax deed, you now must pay all three of the tax certificates as the mortgage holder in order to uh, save the property from a tax deed sale. The, um, you know, I always use the term don't get short arms. Uh, short arms means you can't reach your wallet in your back pocket. 
uh, and many people, well, I don't want to put any money in this, and I don't want to hire a lawyer, I don't want to have to pay their taxes, and and the the problem with that is that you could jeopardize your mortgage position. A good lawyer is going to tell you about all of these things and not let you do that, but it is an investment if it does turn into a foreclosure. What else should I do if the borrower gets behind if it? If I can, Sam, I'm sorry, uh-huh. I had a follow-up question quickly. Somebody asked, does Florida have a redemption period for the tax certificate? Uh, yes. The, it depends on how you're using the term redemption. Um, the, 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 the mortgage holder always has the right to advance the payment on the taxes. Uh, the underlying owner of the property, yes, has the ability to redeem the unpaid taxes, and that is, in fact, the most common way the tax certificate gets redeemed is that the underlying borrower has that right all the way up to uh, the tax deed sale being issued. There are fees, obviously, that mount throughout the process, but yes, uh, the, 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 the owner, the borrower, has a redemption right up to the tax deed sale, and the lender has the right to advance those fees to avoid the tax deed uh, from being issued. Okay, and, actually, so, to clarify, and to clarify, John, I mean to, to interrupt you again, but the person that asked the question said they actually they meant talking about a redemption period for a mortgage. A redemption period for a mortgage. Okay, so if they're talking about redemption in the sense that you're a second mortgage holder and uh, you are uh, the subject of a foreclosure lawsuit ahead of you. In other words, the first files and adds you as a defendant and, and seeks to uh, rid your lien interest off the property, then the answer is yes. As a second mortgage holder, for example, if you have a $200,000 uh, 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 property and uh, $200,000 there's a $100,000 mortgage on the first, and you have a $50,000 second, and all of a sudden the borrower defaults. When the first who holds a $100,000 mortgage files a foreclosure, they're going to add you as the second mortgage uh, holder as a defendant. When they add you as a defendant, you have a right of redemption where you can do one of many things, but one is you can, if the first will allow you to start making the payments on the first, then you can keep them from foreclosing if you can find out they have not already filed foreclosure. You can write them a check. Uh, you write a check for $100,000. You take uh, 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 either an assignment of their mortgage position or, or redemption. It doesn't matter. You now have the right to step in the shoes of the first and foreclose the first and the second for $150,000 on the $200,000 property. Okay. So, oh, yeah, actually, it, I, I, yeah, I'm sorry. The other, one more clarification. This is the problem, I guess, without having a live question. They said that actually it was, was whether or not the borrower has a redemption period to, maybe it's about you're about to talk about this, a redemption period to cure the default on a mortgage. So if somebody is not paying on their first mortgage, do they have a statutorily prescribed time at which they, they can, can cure that default? Yes. Okay, so that's a different concept uh, of redemption. And th- the answer to that is yes. So a borrower who's in default all the way up to the entry of the, the final judgment by the judge can do one of two things. If your loan document gives them a right of redemption – um, then they can reinstate the mortgage uh, all the way up to the time provided for uh, in the loan document. Most loan documents have a 30-day redemption period, meaning that they have the right to uh, redeem the unpaid mortgage uh, if it's more than 30 days in default. Uh, most, but a lot of mortgages, especially privates, do not have that reinstatement right. So 
the borrower does not have a right to compel you to accept all his unpaid payments and all the lawyer's fees you've advanced, etc. cetera. Um, they only have the right to pay off the loan in full if that's your choice. As a lender, though, you, you can modify the mortgage any way you want. If the borrower wants to redeem, reinstate, you can do that throughout the entire foreclosure process. Um, and, but, but in terms of there being uh, any statutory mandated uh, redemption period, the, for, the, the borrower's right of redemption is terminated at the time of the issuance of the certificate of title, excuse me, certificate of sale after the 10-day objection period after the sale. So the borrower has a redemption right all the way up to the sale of the property. Um, and, and so, yeah, it is kind of confusing. There's a number of different redemptions, uh, some of which are really uh, reinstatement rights. Some can be contractual, some can be discretionary by the lender, or some can be uh, mandated by the statutes. So what else could I do if the borrower gets behind on the mortgage? Um, the, 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 again, going along with my theory of being proactive, you, you need to get a meeting with the borrower, go to the property so you can you know, not only look the borrower in the eye, but inspect the, the property and be proactive. If you can't do it because you uh, aren't a hands-on uh, investor and you're more of a portfolio guy, then you need to hire somebody to go do this because it's a very valuable experience to see uh, the inside of the property, uh, talk to the borrower, and find out exactly what's going on. You'll never have that opportunity again uh, once it goes into foreclosure because it's going to get in the hands of some foreclosure defense lawyer, and it's going to be too expensive to ever even get uh, an order of inspection. We're in a state that requires that, that you only hold a lien on the property. You do not have the right like a, a landlord to come in and inspect with a certain number of days notice. The, the, this state does not uh, allow self-help, and you have to get an order from the court to, to gain access to the property. So take advantage of that if the bar is willing to meet with you. Um, Get an inspection, take pictures. A lot of this is common sense. Just tell them you're updating your file. Uh, document whether they live in the property or not, because if there if there are tenants in the property, now you know there's rent income coming off the property, and you might want to apply for a receivership. Although most people do not do that unless it's a commercial property, uh, most most lenders will not do that unless it's a large enough property to justify the legal expense. Uh, but yeah, if, if, the, if there's a commercial tenant in there paying five ten thousand dollars $10,000 a month rent, but that rent is not being paid over to you, the property is not being maintained, uh, then, then that is a, uh, a grounds for a receivership, which we've done on, on many occasions. Uh, you know, getting copies of their tax returns, W-2s and bank statements, you know, it's key that when you're doing these private loans, to make sure your loan documents have a, a lot of these protections. You'd be surprised how many mortgages and notes do not even have the right to request the tax returns and W-2s and bank statements. But uh, my forms do, and a lot of uh, the good lenders that practice, good lawyers that practice in this area do. You know, there's a there's a a lot of people use title companies in Florida, and there's nothing wrong with title companies, but title companies use pre-canned forms, automated forms, and, and they're not uh, going to offer the protections that uh, a real estate lawyer's form database is going to have. Um, what is a mortgage modification and how does it work? Um, so um, work uh, with your attorney to negotiate a modification don't agree to a modification that's unrealistic and just kick the can down the road. So, I mean, you want to make sure that your modification is realistic and the, the borrower can do what they say they can do. Otherwise, all you're doing is allowing the accrued, um, the, the accrued equity erosion to continue. 
the larger your debt gets and the more devalued the collateral is, the more uh, risk that you're taking that you will not recover uh, your full indebtedness. Uh, what are some options in modifications? Well, I mean, the sky's the limit. Whatever you can think of, uh, pay, payment and a half plans, uh, escrowing of taxes and insurance, if that's the only uh, issue, place the accrued interest at the back end of the loan, lower the payment to an affordable level and reamortize, um, get a pledge of additional collateral. A, a lot of people forget this one, but if you have, especially a commercial collateral, if you have a borrower that has a, a home, that you, you can cast a second or third mortgage on that home, and even if there's not a lot of collateral uh, in the equity position on the, on the home, th that becomes tremendous leverage because uh, people don't like to lose their homes, and they will... Uh, find ways to to get current if down the road you have their home uh, as collateral for, again, this would be a commercial uh, lender transaction. Getting other guarantors or co-borrowers is also a, a very effective way to shore up your collateral. Uh, another thing you can do is consider uh, uh, doing a cash for keys program. This is a very difficult one to swallow when the borrower has, uh, you know, stiffed you in essence and owes you money and is uh, not making their mortgage payment. Why would I pay them? Well, once again, uh, uh, you have to keep in mind the two five rule, uh, which is really these days adjusted probably to the two ten rule. Because after, if it takes you two years on average to foreclose, if they go into bankruptcy, it could be much longer than that. Uh, the ex and, and the expense of, of gaining the property, by the time you uh, do all the accrued interest projections, the carry cost on the taxes and the insurance, paying them five grand uh, is looking like a pretty good opportunity for, for uh, if you're doing that projected math. I, I, I put the 15000 there only to uh, show to, to you that I have seen in one case a lender pay the borrower $15,000 uh, to get out of the property. Now, this was a very large loan, and, but it made sense. Um, it, it, keep in mind, remember, if this is a residential property, the borrower can vandalize the property, strip all the, the fixtures out of the property. So, again, the cash for keys program is, um, you know, one that must be strongly considered. Keep in mind if uh, you also can get a deed in lieu of the property, uh, and, and that is simply getting the borrower to deed the property back to you. So you can turn around and liquidate it or sell it. Uh, on, on, on paper and keep your mortgage uh, active and your investment active. The key issue there is you, you got to make sure you do a title search because when you take a deed of, uh, in lieu of foreclosure from a borrower, any and all liens and judgments on the property are going to, to not be cleared off the property and you could lose your priority uh, by virtue of merger of your title interest, I mean your, your lien mortgage interest with title. So if you get fee simple title transferred to you uh, without the appropriate language in the deed in lieu of foreclosure, then you uh, inherited a lot of inferior debt, uh, liens, uh, judgments, all of that have attached to your property you need to make sure that you're, you're, you use the proper deed in lieu in order to preserve your ability to then go and re-foreclose them out, um, if that makes sense. Sometimes it might make sense to just pay them off. Uh, again, looking at the, the 2 five, two ten rule, uh, some of those things that you, you, uh, upon first blush may not make sense, make great sense if you're thinking about uh, the costs associated with getting title to the property. Um, the, the, uh, there, there, are, there are forms that I uh, have that, that allow you to preserve your right to a deficiency. And if the borrower is not getting counsel, 
uh, then you could actually get title to the property. And if it turns out down the road they uh, are a judgment collectible, then you could pursue the deficiency in Florida. You only have one year from the sale date to do that. Um, so uh, the idea here is we weren't really wasn't designed to spend a lot of time on the foreclosure process because that's a, an entire topic in and of itself, but I understand many listeners might have that, that need. But later on, uh, we uh, intend to put forth uh, additional webinars on the foreclosure process, uh, corporate structures for avoiding foreclosures. There's land trust options. Uh, there are a lot of things people do that, that, that need to be closely scrutinized. A lot of people hold a deed in the escrow at the time they make the loan. That is not an enforceable uh, transaction. Um, you know, do's and don'ts of investing in mortgages and loan documents uh, and options for uh, corporate structures for holding assets, you know, LLCs, land trusts, et cetera. So I appreciate the... Uh, the uh, the time that everyone has uh, 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 given today, and um, I appreciate Vanta inviting me to the, uh, the the seminar. This is our contact information, uh, and uh, uh, would be happy to answer uh, any questions that anyone would have uh, offline, so to speak, uh, to try to help you with your existing portfolio or. Uh, in building up a, a, a new portfolio. Yeah, Tony, thanks a lot. We, we did have um, we did have one question come in, and I would encourage anyone who's listening who maybe has something else that they would like to add, uh, please get those typed in now. And as as, as you just mentioned, we're going to be holding uh, a couple of more webinars with Tony, so make sure you look for those uh, on those other topics to get more involved. We we discussed it and thought if we did we could add one webinar for maybe two hours, or, or just or break it up in a, in a series and make it a lot more. Uh, enjoyable and easier for people to par participate. Um, so if you have questions, please type those in. Um, a question came up, and I, again, this is something you probably will cover in a later webinar, but it's being asked now, is uh, would you recommend putting a mortgage or holding a mortgage in a land or a personal trust uh, with a clause transferring beneficial rights back to the lender? Yes, yeah, there, uh, there, this is uh, the subject of one of our future webinars, but um, you definitely have as an option to um, hold the mortgage in a land trust uh, and uh, have uh, it retain the beneficial interest, uh, just as I suggested. That there, there is, there is a, 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 a vein of case law in Florida that says that that, uh, would also need to be foreclosed, but I think that that because many people don't understand land trusts, I think that uh, it, 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 if you can educate the borrower at the time of, of making the loan, uh, that, that you can in fact have the mortgage held in a beneficial uh, held in a land trust and have the beneficial interest automatically revert by uh, assignment uh, or, or holding it in trust uh, upon a default. Again, there are cases that say that that is a, an effort to, to circumvent the foreclosure process, and we're in a judicial foreclosure state, so a sophisticated borrower uh, would probably prevail in compelling a foreclosure, but again, the onus would be shifted to them to bring that action, which uh, has some strategic advantages. All right, well, uh, again, if anyone else had any other questions, somebody wanted to know if you were on Facebook or not. So I don't know if you're, I know Vanta is. We have a we have a Facebook page if someone wants to connect with us there. But I guess they're asking whether you're not you're on Facebook or your company's on yeah. Facebook. Yes, we, we have a, a, a Facebook account, and uh, uh, we're on LinkedIn, and that's, again, another way if people have questions, we can try and uh, assist them in answering uh, questions that they may not have thought of today. All right, well, uh, Tony, I have a, again, I'll put my information here. you got Tony's information here if you want to reach out to him. Uh, again, look for another webinar coming up very soon, uh, probably within the next few weeks. 
uh, with Tony again on those other topics that he mentioned on. But if you have questions in the interim, or certainly if you have kind of a, a private question that you really didn't want to ask here and want to talk to Tony and get his advice or counsel, uh, please contact him uh, here. And if you have questions on an IRA uh, or self-directed IRA and the, what the process is in, in, in investing in that way, please contact me. Here's my contact information on this last slide. Uh, I'm always available uh, anytime to answer a question by email, by phone. Uh, and we do a number of other, other educational webinars and seminars on self-directed IRAs, uh, as many of you who participated know. So if you're looking for more general information on self-direction, please reach out to me or go to our website uh, at advantaira.com. Uh, Tony, thank you very much again for coming on, and we'll look forward to having you here again in a few weeks. Very good. Thanks, everyone.